following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back, and you are Comfortably Zoned with me, the Zigzag Man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of Life Mark Pole, and uh, talking to some really interesting people. Uh, today is no exception. Uh, uh, not only am I talking to some of the most interesting people, in this case, I'm talking to one of my heroes, flat out hero. Welcome back to the, the microphone and uh, the airwaves, Don Wardlow. How are you, sir? Well, I'm doing very well, Ralph, and that's very kind of you, you know, to, to say that about me when I'm really uh, <laughs> Pretty, well, pretty I'll basic. tell you what constitutes heroism. I'm a pretty basic is, guy, just trying to make a living and trying to trying to get to keep it together. Well, let me tell you why you're my hero. You've accomplished things that I wanted to accomplish in life, but were afraid to. And the things that you accomplish are so far beyond what most people would consider within your limitations. Don, you're blind. You're a baseball announcer in professional sports, a professional baseball announcer. How cool is that? It was. It was 12 marvelous years, <laughs> a lot of long bus rides. You know, a lot of very bad movies. <laughs> so right. I spent I spent a lot of time with the headphones on because I couldn't see what was happening in the movies. So okay. there was a lot of thing, a lot of that, but but there was a lot of even get to for you to even get to the point where where you did, you had to have some basic encouragement along the way. Who is your biggest supporter when you were growing up? Well, at the very beginning, it was my grandpa. I discovered baseball quite by accident when I was eight years old. The radio station I happened to listen to was the country music station, WJRZ, out of Hackensack, New Jersey. And oh, yeah, at, that, yeah. at that time, we're talking about 1971, when I was eight years old. That was the I know Hackensack really well, so I know I know where you grew up and Yeah, uh, seventy seventy one uh, was the last year that WJRZ broadcast the Mets and hearing the commercials for the Mets they had this song with these banjos that went Meet the Mets, meet the Mets and it had these banjos and I at that point in my life liked any song that had banjos in it and I figured any you know, baseball team would have that song couldn't possibly be all bad. So that would be they, that, that would be my introduction. I, I'm into, a Met fan too and I'll bet the Mets surprised you by being worse than you thought they could be. Um, well, I was so young and so impressionable that I didn't know what to expect from them. Um seventy one and seventy two they were Kind of middle of the pack, and then don't you know, in '73 they won the pennant and defeated a much better on paper Cincinnati Reds baseball team to get to the World Series and barely, barely lost the World Series to Oakland in seven games. You know, the tough, that was the, tough, the year Pete Rose slid into Buddy Harrelson, who was certainly like yourself did. an overachiever and um. It was a great World Series. It was the only – I attended Game 6 out in Oakland. It was the only World Series game I'd ever attended in my life. Yeah. The... I was terribly disappointed. Coming out of there, I knew that the tide had turned. Um, the momentum had turned. Seaver had uh, not been at his best. And uh, they would lose the next day, and sure enough, they did. Yeah, that was a tough World Series in a couple of ways because not only the Mets, but uh, Grandpa got sick before the Mets began their drive as they began to charge down to the pennant. And you, I would try to tell them, you know, what they were up to, and suddenly 
Grandpa wasn't understanding, you know, what I what I said, what it what it meant, you know, what the what the Mets even were. That that's where he was going, and uh, we we lost him at the end of the year. And much oh, later, so, so. much later, I was able to write a song about Grandpa and his baseball stories. And that song is on YouTube, and it's called "Who Was Babe Ruth, Grandpa." Because Grandpa you know, lived. I'm gonna look. I will look for that, and I will blend that song in to um, uh, to this podcast. And, yeah, he. Uh, at least he had lived in the town. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into any um, anything with YouTube about copying material that. That isn't mine, but uh, I I will put some notes in there. And my condolences uh, for losing your grandfather. At whatever age, uh, my grandfather was directly responsible for my being a baseball fan as well. And um, it brought a bond to us that uh, was everlasting. And uh, I miss Phil Miss, and I'm sure you miss your grandfather. Do you want to name him for... uh, Posterity, a little bit. Yeah, his name was Malcolm Wardlow, and he had gone and seen Gehrig play in DiMaggio because he worked for the railroad, and they would give their railroad workers one pass to a Yankees game every year. And he, oh. he would take he would take my dad, who was also named Malcolm, but Dad was never the baseball fan. It went right from Grandpa to me. You know, it skipped. A generation with my dad. Okay. Um, well, everybody needs support for whatever they're doing, and I'm glad you got yours, and um, it was a great influence for you. How did you conceive of the idea in your head? Because it's got to be, um, you got to think of it before you put it into action of becoming a baseball announcer. Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, early on I wanted to be a disc jockey. Uh, (laughs) It turned out that by the time I got into college, they were already beginning to get into automation and the satellite-driven crud that we now have where radio used to be. So the days of the old disc jockeys were even gone before I even got old enough to be one. But oh, that, that was the days of Murray the K and the Swingin' Soiree, a blast yes, from the and past. Yes, and Wolfman Jack and Cousin Brucey, and I did hear Imus in the morning, of course. Well, he was so funny. But as for oh, yeah. becoming a becoming a baseball announcer, I would, it wouldn't have happened if I only listened to the best, which I did growing up. I listened to Bob Murphy and... Phil Rizzuto and Bill White, and you hear these guys, and you could never imagine that you could possibly be, you know, as good as they are. However, what what did it for me was I discovered college radio when I was in high school. I found the radio stations belonging to Columbia and Fordham and Seton Hall, and all three of those broadcast a certain amount of baseball games every year and these guys were only a few years older than me and they sounded like regular people and they made regular mistakes that regular people would make where you know Bob Murphy and Phil Rizzuto were Hall of Famers Harry Callis was a Hall of Famer and you can't get an idea that you could do the job just listening to those guys I learned that I could do it listening to the college versions of Matt Lachlan, who's now the voice of the Jersey Devils, uh, Charlie Slows, who's the voice of the the Nationals, the Washington Nationals, who are now in the World Series, and Michael mm-hmm. Kay, who does the Yankees on television. I heard them oh, all as has college for years and years. Yeah, I heard them all as college students, and I had tapes of their games as college students and I would listen to them and and that's what got me thinking I could actually do this if I could find a sighted person who would do my play by play I'd be the color commentator wow so I went to Glassboro State which is now called Rowan University it's a division 3 school in Glassboro New Jersey 
and I asked everybody. I asked. There was a whole list of guys who wanted to be sports broadcasters, and every one of them initially said no. Every single one. There must have been 15 or 16 of them on the list. And then the last one on the list was a guy named Jim Lucas. And he was only last on the list because I had repeatedly tried to reach him and not been able to do so. And finally, after I'd asked everybody else, one night, coming out of the studio from doing a scoreboard show, I heard Jim talking, and he said, Hey, Don, nice job. And I recognized the voice because... I had recordings of a couple of his games, and I had listened to them constantly, you know, in my dorm. I didn't have a whole lot to listen to at that time. So I listened to what few games I had repeatedly, and I had I had Jim's voice down. I would have recognized him anywhere. And I figured since he never returned my phone calls, I'd better you know, take this chance while I've got it. And I said... You know, hey, Jim, would you come back to my dorm room and talk with me about something? And luckily enough, he did. And he later admitted he was quite surprised that I knew who he was because even though he had a disc jockey show and had done a couple of ball games, he didn't get regular recognition around the campus. So he followed me back to the dorm. And it turned out he had lived in my dorm room before I had ever gotten there, which explained where the old pizza boxes and beer cans came from that were there when I moved in. So. <laughs> and did you add to those pizza boxes and, and beer cans? Oh, uh, absolutely. Oh, you know oh, it. Good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but we got we, we, spirit going. So we got talking about different things sports-wise, and I said, you know, Jim, are you up for a challenge? Would you do sports with a blind guy? And he didn't have to think too long, but he thought for a minute or so, and he said, yeah, I can do that. And this was November of 1983, and so in November, at that time, college basketball was just about to start at the very end of November and the beginning of December, where, you know, today that stuff begins in early November. The season has gotten longer for college basketball. Like almost every sport, the season seems to have gotten longer. But right. uh, we we had to wait until the first Saturday of December. That was the first game that Jim and I did together, and that was on a tape recording because the – sports director at the station wasn't real happy with the idea of a blind person on his airwaves and he said if you guys make a tape and you're as good as what I'm already putting out on the air then you know I'll give you an opportunity so Jim and I did that and the fella did agree that we were as good as his his product and a few nights later we got our first opportunity to broadcast basketball on the radio. And later on, now, what was months his later, it was he baseball. gave you a break. Mention oh, his name. My broadcast partner? No, that was, uh, that was Mr. Lucas, but the fellow at the station that gave you a break. Yeah, finally, yes, that was Al Sybil. After oh, he okay, after he had got his name got his name on the air. That, yeah, um, he he'd heard the product and finally agreed to let us go on. We did a couple of games. At that time the station only did a handful of games and so the the few games they did had to be split among all these broadcasters that the station had back then. So right. it was a lot it was a lot different than today where the station broadcasts pretty much every basketball game for the men and most of the ball games for the women. You know, at the time I was there, there was only a handful of men's games and no women's games whatsoever. And that was before, uh, what was it, Proposition 9 or... Title 9, uh, yes. The, the, Title the, team, the team existed, but the radio station didn't cover it. 
uh, Don, for for our audience, tell tell uh, us what Title IX was and why it came into being. Yeah, Title IX was the rule that the NCAA adopted that allowed for college sports teams for women to expand the way they have. You know, before Title IX, there were very few college women's basketball teams and softball and volleyball. And now, thanks to that regulation, they're basically all over the country at all levels. You have the women's sports trying to uh, match up with what the men are producing. Don, how did you keep from feeling sorry for yourself when you were a kid? Well, <laughs> it's it's difficult. Sometimes I did, like everybody, you know. But my my parents did a lot to see to it that I grew up as normal as anybody else, and they wouldn't accept me saying that I couldn't do things because I was blind. And they made sure that as many things as I could physically do, that that I got the chance to do them, and I didn't use my blindness as a crutch. Well, that um, absolutely beautiful philosophy they, that they passed on to you. Um, just do the best you can with what you can. You play the hand you, had, you were dealt, and um, it, it worked. It worked because satisfaction in life comes from doing the best you can. That's all you can do, and um, you've done that. You continue to do that. Um, what are you doing now, and what's next in your life? Well, I... Tell us started. about the book that you're writing. Oh well, yes, I. That began actually as just a blog. I started out as a daily blog called Baseball as I See It, and I started doing that, coming off of uh, severe spinal surgery. Um, my my brother had the idea that to stimulate my mind while my body was recovering from the spinal surgery that I ought to start the blog. And so I wrote pieces daily starting in August of 2015. And I don't do it daily now, but I do it whenever I get the chance. Uh, the blog still exists, and the uh, Facebook group where, where that can I be began. Found, can be found on Facebook. Am I correct? There's yeah. The main the main site is not directly related to Facebook, but after the blog had been in existence a couple of months, I thought I ought to begin a Facebook group, which would um, I would put messages up there when a new blog feature is available because the main address for the blog is a little bit difficult for people to copy down. Uh, what it is is baseballasiseeit.com, but you have to put dashes in between each word, in between the words baseball as I see it. You put a dash in between each word. And so to make it easier, every time there's a new link, I put that link on the Facebook page, which the group is just called Baseball as I See It, without the dashes. So I, I've got, gotten a lot of members, and interestingly enough, I've had eight new members join the group just this week during the World Series. Wow. I love that. Nice. I haven't had that many new members in a long time. Now, this so, book is, uh, you're writing it, you mentioned to me that our mutual friend, Ian Conowitz, has been a big help to you, keeping it together. Well, initially, as I say, we just had the blog. You know, my brother put it up on the web website, and he showed me how to work the particular website. 
and writing the blog for a few weeks, I got the idea, well, if I can do this blog, maybe I can write you know, my life story about my baseball years in particular and and some stuff about the years of my boyhood, you know, leading up to my baseball career. And Ian Kahanowitz had been a reader of my blog from the very beginning, even before I started writing on the book. And we got into discussions when I realized that he had a book that had been published and he was talking about doing a book tour, which I think he's already been on for a while. And I had actually sent a couple of letters to a couple of other authors and not heard anything back from them. But Ian was a gentleman and was... Uh, very willing to uh, let me talk to him and you now we're working on the idea of him actually being a co-author I don't know if he's going to commit all the way to that or not I was asked by him to write an outline for the part of the book that hasn't been written yet which is a considerable part of the book the manuscript up to 1992 was written without an outline. It was written basically off the top of my head. Uh, But Ian said I had to stop doing that. I had to draw up an outline for the rest of the book and send it to him, and then we would go from there. And that's not done yet. I'm, I'm almost to the end of the outline, but I'm not all the way there yet. But once I get there, I'm going to send it to him and we'll see what Ian wishes to do from there. Wow. I have the privilege of uh, being a producer at Comfortably Zone Radio Network, and Ian's podcast, Genesis, uh, he's um, it's kind of on hold now since he's been writing the book and um, doing his promotion. But if you go into the archives, folks, and... Um, on YouTube and punch in Comfortably Zoned and Ian Kahanowitz or just simply Comfortably Zoned and Genesis, mm-hmm. you would come up with hundreds of hours of um, his interviews with authors, and um, he is terrific. He's been a mainstay at Comfortably Zoned, and the fact that he's helping you and that uh you working together really makes me feel good. Yeah, you know, I am not sure if I would have carried on if Ian and I hadn't struck up our acquaintance because, I I mean, I knew as an academic fact, I knew it would, would be difficult to write the book. I knew that as an academic fact. But knowing it that way and actually doing it, actually spending hours every day or every couple of days, you know, pounding out memories, digging up, you know, turning over mossy rocks from the depths of your memory, you know, is Don, not... Don, what is the equipment that you use on the Internet that has you translate... Um the the written word to audio so that you can absorb it. I use a screen reader called Jaws, and it's 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 icon for people who can see is a little shark. So I it is what it sounds like Jaws, and okay. it means literally it means job application with speech. So. Uh. I've watched Jaws evolve from the baby shark to what it is now, going back to 1999 when I got my first computer. Jaws then was Jaws 3.0 was just coming in. Jaws 2 was almost done, and 3 was coming in. And I, year by year, or every couple of years maybe, a new version of Jaws would come out. And now... We're up to Jaws 2019, and uh, it has evolved incredibly, just as the Internet itself has evolved from dial-up 
to broadband, which it is now, now into the different windows. We've gone from Windows 95, which I think was the setup I had when I first got my computer, to now Windows 10, which I do not have, but most of the world does. And JAWS has and evolved enough. And most of the world is going to have to. I think they're eliminating everything but. Um, yeah, so sure. I've been told. That's uh, going to have to be worked out eventually. But yeah, what I was... A whole, for all of us, it's a whole new learning curve. I'm sure for you it's especially difficult. Um, not from what I've been told. I've talked to other blind people about it. And they say it isn't any, especially too difficult if I can do Windows 7, which I can. You know, they say I can catch up with this fairly easily because JAWS has done what's necessary to allow us to stay even with Windows 10. So when you, This is uh, just a technical question. When you make the switch from Windows 7, which I'm going to have to do shortly, to Windows 10, do you keep the stuff in your browser that, that's in there, or, or do you have to start all over again, um, or do you even know? I'm well, curious. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask my brother about that. Now, right. one thing, one thing that has no doubt, the the book, the manuscript, and the book outline will be copied and not not copied on the internet but copied on a particular hard drive you know so that even the change shouldn't i hope uh, affect those things that have cost me so much labor i don't want to lose those now in you any just way talk into it and it transcribes your your speech no i type i've been typing since i was in third grade and it took me about three years to master typing to go from from third grade to sixth before I was particularly good at uh, working on a typewriter. But with JAWS, I can hear letter by letter what I'm typing in. So if I do make a mistake, I can go backwards and I can straighten it out uh, much more easily than I could back when I was only learning to type on the typewriter. Wow. Um what you've overcome, and um, you understand now why, uh, just from saying the words yourself, why you're my hero? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're really terrific, and um, and you're an incredibly articulate guy, too. You give a great podcast, so will you continue to keep coming back? I'd be glad to, Ralph. That would be a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Um, you're an inspiration, not only to me, but now I'm going to get to pass it on a little bit. Because uh, you've been on before, but it's been a, a number of years. It's been about two years now. So um, have a, m many of our audience, our audience members, didn't hear the first first time around. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait to post this, and I will uh, during the the early part of the coming week. Thank well, you, Wardlow. Yeah, my hope is that they'll join the group, Baseball As I See It, on Facebook, if they are Facebook people. And also, I write a column now for a magazine called Consumer Vision. Maybe some of them would like to read that. You know, month by month, I write a column for the magazine. So anything what, that... What is the link? How can people find that? Now, consumer vision, you would do best to just Google the term consumer vision because I don't exactly know its website right off the top of my head. But okay. my my column on there is called A Word About Sports, and it's a fairly brief column. I've written one for, I think, the September-October editions. The two, I've written two columns for them up to now. And it's a it's an interesting little magazine published out of Massachusetts. Whoop. All right, Don. Hi. I got a phone going off here, and I can't turn it off. 
we will talk soon, and um, thank you, my friend. Yeah, thank pleasure you. to be on with you, Ralph. Yep. Take and care. thanks for my audience for listening. I hope you will do us both a favor if you enjoyed this podcast or any of the offerings on the Comfortably Zone Network. Would you box up some lightly used or new children's books and take them to the Head Start program in whatever community you live in? Kids need books. They need to learn to read. They need to expand their imagination. And they need to become school ready. And the kids that need them the most happen to be involved in the Head Start program one way or the other. They're getting a Head Start or they're not. And um, if you'll do that, it, uh, you'll throw a lot of good vibes into the universe. And uh, I'd appreciate it. So do that, keep listening, and uh, again, uh, Don Wardlow, my hero. Have a great one, sir. And you too, Ralph. Adios, everyone. All right. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.